Welcome back to the AmeriCorps Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the front lines, Surgeons Voices. And with me today are two surgeons, Dr. Uh, Lori Albert, who is the chief of staff and a general surgeon at the Astria Toppenish Hospital in Toppenish, Washington, and Dr. Hannah Warax. Dr. Warax is a breast oncologist, surgical breast oncologist at Duke University. Ladies, welcome. So I'd like to start out talking about the way I, I got connected to you. And that is I did a series of interviews of the Latino Surgical Society leadership, leaders from the Society of uh, Asian Academic Surgeons, Society of Black Academic Surgeons, Association of Women Surgeons, and, and then um, found um, that Dr. Warax was part of the Association of American Indian Physicians and chatted with her and found that there's no surgical association for Native Americans. Dr. Alvord, congratulations, you've been elected to the board of the Association of American Indian Physicians. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that organization, when it started, who it serves, and, and what you might do uh, in your tenure on the board. Uh, yeah, so um, Association of American Indian Physicians, uh, I don't know when it, when it started, but uh, I can tell you that when I was a student and a resident, it was in existence. So that goes back at least as far as the 70s and 80s, the 80s and 90s for med school and residencies. I think it existed at least several decades before that. And I believe that there are close to a thousand American Indian physicians and they meet annually. They provide many programs for their participants, as well as for medical students and residents who are Native. Much of their work is surrounding adapting to medicine. Actually, many of the programs they have are either on cross-cultural medicine, which is about teaching how to work with Native tribes, or helping young Native students and residents navigate their way through medical school and residency, as well as helping undergraduates apply to medical school. That is a very big focus as well. So mentoring, support, there are some traditional ceremonies that are held at our annual meetings to provide spiritual support and uh, cultural support to our participants. But we do not have groups of specialties within the umbrella group. They're actually planning groups that are going to be regionally defined geographically so they'll probably have a northwest and a southwest and you know a southeast midwest but as I joined the group one of the platforms of my campaign was that we should have specialty groups at first I don't think that they were quite big enough to have that that level of sophistication but we are now fairly large and I do think that it would be very helpful for us to have for example a surgeon's group within our group family medicine, OB, obstetrics, gynecology, etc. It makes sense because we can mentor each other. We, we're going through the same things. We have the same issues, those types of things. We have many, many parallels. So you, you mentioned you know, mentoring, you mentioned medical school, and you mentioned residency. And let, let's continue on the theme of mentoring. And let's start by asking Dr. Warax, in recent years, when you were going through medical school and training, were there any unique challenges you felt because of being Native American? And, and also as part of that, who were your mentors? Did you have any Native American mentors? So I had a, a bit of a different experience than most Native Americans will in America. Um, I'm not a part of a federally recognized tribe, so I did not grow up on a reservation. We're a fairly assimilated group in Southern North Carolina. Um, and because of that, and what my ancestors had to do to assimilate, we operate day to day, mostly like the general population. Because of that, my granddaddy was able to go to the Navy and enroll in medical school through a naval program that Duke had at the time. So I was exposed to medicine very early in my life, which is a privilege that most people, um, most Natives in the country aren't allowed um, or just don't have the opportunity for. So for me, my granddaddy was my introduction to medicine, um, and he was a family doc for our uh, 
local county, which is the both the poorest and one of the most rural counties in the state. Um, so I, I saw what it was like to have no resources from very early in life. Um, and having his expertise uh, sort of helped shift me into medicine in a way that was fairly straightforward. But I would tell you, after I got into medical school, it was sort of a rude awakening because you go from a location where at least 70% of the people surrounding you are Native American to seeing maybe one or two Natives a week at most in clinic because they were referred um, to the subspecialist that you're shadowing. Uh, none of my mentors um, from a clinical standpoint look like me. Um, and it's very difficult because you can't identify with any of the other minority groups because your, your challenges and um, the stigmas that you face are different. Uh, and it, that's not to downplay one group as being more oppressed or, or treated differently than the other. It's just, we all have our own challenges. And um, so it was very difficult early on to see myself as anything other than what my granddaddy did because he was the only exposure I had. Uh, so I went to medical school thinking I was going to do family medicine uh, and almost graduated doing family medicine and realized that I, I really loved surgery. And uh, I had uh, mentors that did not look like me uh, that looked at me and told me that it was possible and that I could do it. Um, so for me, that was the big thing was that you don't have to look like me, sound like me, um, in any way be similar to me. You just have to believe in us as individuals. Um, and I think it actually is sometimes more meaningful for someone who has no idea what it's been like for you uh, growing up and, and struggling in your community to tell you that it's possible um, and that they're there to help you um, and can make those connections for you and help you get where you want to go in life. Um, and it, really, if it wasn't for mentors like that, I don't think that I would have graduated medical school, I wouldn't have graduated residency for sure, and uh, fellowship wouldn't have been possible either. So um, it, you don't have to have someone that looks like you to be an excellent mentor, and that's really the message that I want to send to the rest of the college is that um, just because you have a Native American mentee, don't think that you can't identify with them and be just as impactful in their life. Um, I, I am my career to my mentors and none of them are Native American. So other than Dr. Albert, she was my silent mentor. Uh, her book um, was uh, uh, a unique way for her to sort of touch my life as a mentor without knowing it. So, um, but outside of that, you, it's possible without people necessarily being able to identify um, similarly to you. Well, before I go back to Dr. Albert to speak about her book, let's just ask you, you mentioned um, some of the unique challenges, which are different than challenges to other groups. W would you be able to enumerate what are some of the unique challenges? Sure. I think that um, a global way of saying it for me is that uh, majority of the time we're the silent minority. Um, people forget that we exist. <laughs> Um, so uh, I, I was very often asked, what are you, uh, when I walked into a, a, a separate space, and I'm sure Dr. Alfred's gotten that question on occasion, um, when she's walked into a, a room full of people that did not look like her and didn't identify as Native, um, and people always try to place you as one thing or another, well, are you mixed, are you Black, are you Hispanic, um, and it, it, it's difficult because you say, no, I'm Native American, and then it's followed up by, well, what part? how much, um, all of me, <laughs> um, that's what I identify as. And it, it's just, it's very difficult because you're in your homeland, right? But people still don't see you. Um, so it, 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 it's a very different challenge from other groups who have a, a pretty large um, minority group to sort of lean to and, and, um, and be able to identify with and, and sort of help them through um, separate periods in their lives. But I've been the only Native American that was present in my surgical training as a whole um, and in my fellowship training uh, and as part of the faculty now um, at my institution. So it's, it's difficult because there's no one that I can sort of reach out to that can in any way identify with that. Um, but it, it, it's, that part is sort of, um, I see that as a way to educate people, right? That we are still here, we do still exist. Um, and yes, we're not mentioned in the data, but um, we're, we're not so small um, that we're insignificant, right? Um, so it, it, 
it's a strange challenge for people to, to see you and still not see you at the same time. Um, I don't know, Dr. Alvord, was your, your experience fairly similar? So I came at a very different time and from quite a different place than Hannah. You know, her tribe is on the eastern side of the country and I'm Navajo, we're over in the southwest. And I think true contact with white people, with, Amer with quote, Americans, probably was, it was quite infrequent until maybe 1920s or 30s, uh, and then only with Navajo traders, people who came out to trade goods with our people. The U.S. government only had a treaty with us in 1868, so we're talking about a very, very compressed time, and I would say the children were not even in schools until the 40s and 50s for the most part. Growing up in the 60s, my class in grade school, probably only 30% spoke English. So they were actually still fluently Navajo and did not even speak English and very much practiced their tradition as they had for hundreds of years. I am half Navajo and half white, and that made me perhaps have a much bigger window into the outer world, if you will, because not only are we within our own culture, but we are geographically remote. This is a very, very rural part of America, up in the Four Corners region. Think of Monument Valley or Lake Powell or some of these places that are extremely remote. I did have a mentor. I never would have considered medicine without having really fallen in love in college with neurosciences just as an offshoot of psychology and then found myself in as a research assistant in a neurobiology lab and a neurologist who happened to later be the chair of neurology at UNM was head of that lab. We were studying hydrocephalus and he encouraged me to go to medical school. But I had come in from a reservation high school and had really not done well in college in the sciences. Uh, I wasn't prepared. And I also was at Dartmouth, which is a very high-powered uh, academic environment. And so I took my first courses and got a C and a D and just thought I wasn't smart enough to be in any science, but grabbed onto psychology and found myself into this research assistantship. And they, they talked me into thinking about med school. And uh, I went back and took all the pre-med classes at University of New Mexico. And by that time, since I did have a a Dartmouth education. I did know how to study and critically think and did fine after that with courses, but really just hope to be in primary care. I didn't even believe that I could be in medicine period, but actually found myself at Stanford. And that was probably because they had almost no Native American applicants. And my scores on my MCATs were okay, and I had a Dartmouth degree. But I found a mentor in a Native surgeon who worked near where I was raised. His name was Ron Lujan, and he was from the Pueblos of New Mexico. He was from San Juan Pueblo and Taos Pueblo. And I'm sure that he was one of the very first surgeons in America. I know Charles Eastman, I think, was a surgeon or physician back in the 1800s. He wrote a book and whatnot, and he was Lakota. But we really did not have many surgeons. And he went to University of New Mexico for training. He was working out in a little bitty hospital near where I was raised. And I went out there between year one and two to work with their primary care docs and to live at home for the summer. And I met him. And pretty soon I was spending more time with him than I was with the primary care doctors. I fell in love with the operating room. I um, was very good with my hands from a very early age. I uh, knew how to, I, I learned classical piano way out in the middle of nowhere. I would find piano teachers, the seventh grade English teacher, or the Mormon pastor's wife or whoever I could get piano lessons from. And I had a Lakota best friend who taught me Lakota beadwork, which is very tiny beads and, and very fine work. So my dextrosity was there. He started letting me first assist in cases. And when I told him I wanted to go into surgery, he tried to talk me out of it. And we're talking, well, I went to med school in 81 and graduated in 85. So it was right around that time. He said, you're not going to have a life. You're not going to get married. You're not going to have a family. He told me all these things that being a woman in surgery was nearly impossible. And I just said, I just want to do this is all I want to do. I want to do this. And so then when I convinced him, he taught me every major general surgery case, all the pre-op management, all the post-op management. And I knew all of that before I did my formal surgery rotation at Stanford in my third year. And so when I went in, 
I was a rock star and they were really impressed and invited me to apply to their surgery residency program. And um, so I did and finished my training at Stanford. And I think that without him, I never would have been a surgeon. There were huge cultural chasms and obstacles along the way. But if you love surgery enough, <laughs> there's really very little that will deter you from, from, your, from your goal. Okay, that's, that's a great story. Thanks so much for sharing it. But I know it's fantastic. But what about the book? Okay, so, um, so when I finished my training program, uh, I came back to work in Gallup, New Mexico. And I started doing some work where, well, first of all, there were so many Native patients who were afraid of Western medicine. They were afraid of, of operating rooms, of surgeons. They would be referred to us, and then they would disappear. We'd never see them again. Or once in a while, the medicine men would refer them to us. The patients would say, the medicine man said he, was, he tried to fix my gallstones, but they're too bad and I need to have my gallbladder removed. And so they were being handed to us, referred from the medicine men, but they were still so afraid. So I developed a way of caring for them that was very respectful of their beliefs and traditions and even invited the medicine men to have prayers for them either before or after surgery. We arranged to have them bring their things that were sacred to them, eagle feathers, or um, we call them fetishes, but they're small animal figures sometimes that they carry with them, or corn pollen bags. They got to bring them with them to the OR. They were in a plastic bag, but they got to bring them in. And we just did things very, very differently. We were very respectful when we interviewed them for an HMP, sort of letting them lead the way with their story instead of extracting information from them. We we're very careful to keep their, their bodies covered up, except to expose one small area at a time because they're very modest people. Anyway, I was just sort of doing this all naturally. And there was an article written about it in the Stanford Alumni Magazine. I didn't think that much about it, just a little column about my work. And the next thing I knew, I got a call from a journalist who was Anna Quinlan's assistant at the New York Times. She asked if she could come and interview me for a bigger story. And so she did, and she was an Albuquerque girl, so um, she knew our, our world fairly well. Her name was Elizabeth Cohen. She wrote an article and sold it to the New York Times, and it, and it took up a half a page, which is quite a lot in that newspaper. Um, and I thought, okay, that's cool, and I just kept doing what I do. Then she came back about a week later, week and a half, and she said, uh, Lori, we're getting all these calls from publishers and editors asking if we'll write a book about this. And I said, oh my goodness, you know, uh, that wasn't on the, that wasn't on the menu. That wasn't a plan. Um, but we had, we hired an agent and as you know, or you may not know with books, but when you try to get a book published, usually you have to write the book and then find an agent who will represent you. And then that agent has to sell the book to publishing houses and editors. And ours was exactly upside down and backwards. We <laughs> had the editors and publishers, we had to find an agent and then, the agent auctioned our book off to six houses and Bantam won that auction and Bantam was then absorbed by Random House. So we were under Random House. It took us about three years, but she came out, she basically shadowed me for a year. We pulled in a lot of culture, a lot of our family history and stories, and then this way of delivering care. And then also we, we took a little bit of a dip into native medicine as well. But it really detailed a, a memoir biography of coming from the reservation to become a surgeon. That was the other part of the book. And uh, it was a bestseller. So, well, last time I checked, which was about 10 years ago, I think we were about 50,000 copies. But it's continued to be in print and to sell. It's used in many courses. And it's also used in book clubs and medicine and literature courses and cross-cultural medicine courses, because it also talks about how to care for Native patients in a culturally competent way. That led to quite a number of speaking engagements for me, and I began working actually on understanding our ceremonies and looking at ceremonies through the eyes of science to see what healing might be available and finding multiple layers of that. The psychology or mind-body medicine, both in physical wellness that is advocated through some of our ceremonies, and probably most importantly through uh, in the environmental studies world, where there are many, many teachings about living 
in harmony with the land and caring for it and respecting it and, and not desecrating it and um, keeping everything clean and pure, which um, goodness knows if, if that had been followed by all cultures, uh, we wouldn't be dealing with global warming right now. It seems like it just snowballed and I found myself, oh, I don't know, I think I've probably given six or seven um, commencement addresses at different medical schools, have uh, now some honorary degrees, and it culminated with the nomination for Surgeon General from in 2013 for, by um, the National Congress of American Indians and the National Indian Health Board. And then my own school, Stanford, uh, gave me a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018. So it's been quiet work. It's been uh, very fulfilling for me because the biggest thing I can take away from it is the number of students who have told me it's inspired Native students that have told me it's inspired them to go either into college or into a medical field or to become a physician. And, and I have a couple that have said to be in a surgeon. So, so that's great. And I'm mentoring a young surgeon now who's in training at the University of Washington in vascular, vascular surgery. So it's, it's been a wonderful journey. Oh, that, that's fantastic. Incredibly impressive. Um, congratulations. Wonderful, wonderful achievements. This is a fantastic conversation. I'm, I'm getting a tremendous education, as I'm sure are all our listeners and viewers. So what we're going to do is break at this point and resume again with the second part next week.